So the title of my talk today is Water Stories. It's all about restoring the health of Earth's water cycle. And if you find this interesting, check out waterstories.com. We have a lot of free films, a lot of educational materials, animations about the water cycle, a lot of more information that you can dig into if you find this interesting. So there's three really big takeaways from this talk today. The first is the full water cycle, what the full water cycle is, how interconnected it is, how important it is. And then the watershed death spiral, how humans have led ourselves down this really bleak path of the watershed death spiral. And then the third piece is about reviving the water cycle, how us humans can be the catalyst for positive change. And when we look at water, it really is the lifeblood of our planet. All life is 70% water by volume, more than 99% water molecularly. And so we really are water living. And when you look around the world, you see all these communities in crisis from these issues that actually stem from a water cause. You see flooding all around the world, seemingly worse and more horrific every year. These mega droughts happening year after year, crippling regions. And then as things really dry out and desertify, we get these huge fires engulfing the forest that do remain. And we see this every year, more intensive, more destructive, more concerning with floods. No matter where you are in the world, you know someone who's been affected by flood, by droughts, these mega droughts, crippling agricultural areas. And then these fires taking homes, taking lives, taking forests, all from this watershed death spiral. And all these crises really stem from our relationship with water and nature, how previous generations have stewarded or disrespected water and nature. So we call them natural, but there's really nothing natural about these. And when we look at the full water cycle, we can really start to understand how diverse and interconnected nature truly is. Now, this is a concept that's been around for a long time. Look into the work of Victor Schauberger. And as that water meets a cool and shaded soil, it's able to infiltrate really rapidly. So it feeds the rest of the landscape. It feeds into springs and creeks and rivers, clear, cool, oxygenated water throughout the year. Now it's providing that water to vegetation, which is transpiring that water into the atmosphere, cooling the air, 590 calories per gram of water that it transpires creating more water within the small water cycle. And then we look at this water evaporating off the ocean by the sun, drifting inland. In order to actually fall as precipitation, it needs a nuclei to form around, something for that water vapor to start to condense around. One of the primary nuclei is hygroscopic microorganisms produced within the leaves of trees. These bacteria, along with fungal spores, drift up into the atmosphere and provide the spark water vapor to condense into liquid, forming droplets, now actually creating a low pressure, a vacuum, drawing in more moist air from the coast. And so it's this conveyor belt of moisture called the biotic pump, bringing this water from the oceans through the Earth's continents. It's infiltrating into this cool, shaded soil. It's transpiring again in the smaller water cycle. And so we have a really consistent, balanced, healthy, productive climate throughout the year. And when we look at a place like the Amazon, the Amazon is actually pulling moisture into the South American continent, bringing it into other regions that should be desert, but because of this biotic pump, this healthy forest, pulling moisture off of the ocean inland, these regions actually get quite a bit of rainfall. And so it's really important as you start to lose this biotic pump, you start to have all sorts of impacts with hurricanes along the Atlantic Ocean, and you get this breakdown of this otherwise very stable system. And so what this leads to, what human activity has tended to lead to is the watershed death spiral, where we clear the landscapes, we clear the vegetation, we expose the soil to the sun, it gets hot and hardened, and it can no longer infiltrate the rain. So all that rain runs downhill, causing flooding. But then because the rain didn't infiltrate, it also is causing drought. 
now on all these hot, dry landscapes, they actually, the more they heat up, the more heat they can hold. So they're creating these high pressure heat domes that actually reject the incoming lower pressure air. Eventually that pressure of the system builds up so much that it overcomes anyway, and you get these huge deluges, bigger, stronger, more severe storms than ever before with longer periods of drought in between. And so flood and drought are really two sides of the same coin. And because we have the flood followed by the drought, these very desertified, desiccated landscapes are then burning once they dry out even more. And so you have this cycle of extremes, extreme heat followed by extreme flooding events, followed by extreme drought, followed by extreme fire. And we're seeing it worse and worse all around the world. As that soil heats up, it really rejects that rain, shunting it downstream and holding more and more heat. And so we see this all over the world, these abused landscapes that are then falling into this cycle of flood, drought, and fire. And so what we really should be aiming towards is reviving the water cycle, bringing water from the oceans back inland, feeding it into the landscape, infiltrating it into the ground to recharge springs, to recharge creeks and rivers. And as that water infiltrates into the landscape, it allows for more vegetation. The vegetation transpires that water, it cools the air, and then it also produces those hydroscopic microorganisms into the atmosphere. Now that water vapor is condensing and falling as rain. And so we're actively moving heat away from the surface of the earth into the atmosphere and we're clearing this humid haze which otherwise holds in the heat overnight. And so when we start to revive cycle, we can make healthy productive communities that are really resilient against impacts of climate change. Water desertified one third of Earth's land. It's one third of all the land on Earth has been desertified in just 10,000 years. And we can look at the Fertile Crescent 10 to 12,000 years ago, the birthplace of agriculture. This was once one of the most fertile basins in the world. Now it's a desert because they broke the water cycle. They broke the vegetation. They broke the infiltration. They broke the actual precipitation cycle. So now you have this hot, humid desert, which is full of extremes. And so this technology moved around the world six to 8,000 years ago, moving into the Sahara, desertifying what was before a rich savanna. 6,000 years ago, it moved into the Tibetan Plateau, a place contiguously inhabited by humans for 20,000 years, but only 6,000 years ago, when the plow and the domestic animal came there, did this desertification occur. And so this is from the old water paradigm. Back when we were defecating in the streets, that waste was being carried downstream by water and any pooled water meant disease, a vector for sickness. And so as we developed these larger, higher concentration civilizations, we had to drain all the water away to manage our waste. Now, today we manage our waste in a much more sanitary manner, but we still have all of these drainage systems in place. Whenever we create a home, we're taking what was a landscape that infiltrated water and we're creating hardscape that allows none of that to infiltrate. When we create a road, when we create agricultural areas by draining wetlands, we consistently drain the landscape through this old water paradigm. And so this is really part of humanity's legacy, but it's also something we can very much reverse. We can be the keystone species in the restoration of Earth's biosystems. And so this requires a new water paradigm where we really look to water as this sacred source of life. We have much respect for it, we have much love for it, and we find ways to steward. We help water infiltrate into the landscape. Anywhere where we're creating runoff, we find ways to infiltrate that back into the land. And so this is SEP's global vision for water retention around the world. And when you see some of these examples, you'll understand that anywhere in the world, we can restore a healthy water cycle. This is a project of SEP Holzer's in Portugal called Tamara. This is a landscape that was running out of water. They barely had enough water for the community, barely any for any agriculture. 
and on this same landscape with just the natural materials and the resources freely available by nature, this was the landscape created there. Now this community is water self-sufficient and actually feeds water back into the aquifers for their neighbors. So this is a landscape in just a short transformation, turning these drainage systems, which we've imposed upon the landscape and finding ways to steward that vital resource of water. And so this was just done by undoing the roads and turning the roads into a water body, creating roads still up the dam so you have access, but making it in a way where the road is actually elevating the water table rather than sinking the water table down. And so this is the work of Sepp Holzer, a rebel farmer, uh, my mentor, and a great inspiration to many people around the world. And he took this mountainside farm, the Kramaterhof, which was thought to be worthless land and created this vibrant productive oasis, 72 interconnected ponds and water bodies and food falling on the ground year round. And so this is a really incredible model. This is in the coldest part of Austria, high in the Alps, yet it's a very productive farm that's naturally productive. Rather than trying to mirror natural systems with their agricultural systems, they're creating ecological systems that produce in an agricultural way. And so these systems are immensely productive with very little labor. This is a fruit tree with no inputs, just the resources from nature, using them in symbiosis with nature. And this tree is literally falling over from the weight of its own productivity, has grapes growing up within it, falling over from its weight as well. And so this is the kind of fertility that's possible when we really do partner with nature. And this is just a beautiful example you see on a landscape that can produce ample water for all your needs, ample food, medicine, fuel, building materials, everything that we need can be biotic relationship with nature rather than an extractive controlling one like what we have today. And what really scares me is we're getting better at it. This old water paradigm of draining the water away, not stewarding this vital resource, it's getting better and better year after year and spreading quicker and quicker around the world. We now have these concrete metropolises that allow no water to infiltrate into the landscape that have huge impacts on the watersheds as a whole. And when you look at these large cities around the world, they're mostly developed in what were these fertile rich valley bottoms. And so all this water that would have entered this valley is being drained away, but it's not only the water that hits that valley, but the water that's being carried to that valley by the mountains around it. And so areas like this would have been rich, vibrant wetlands, yet we've consistently drained them and created these concrete metropolises that you see today. And so this is what we've done to our water flow over time. This is a hydrograph. This is looking at water flow through the landscape in two different scenarios. One scenario where you have the hot, hardened, concreted landscape, and another scenario where you have rich vegetation still in place. So in the first scenario, when the rain falls, it's nearly all runoff, very little infiltration. And so you're creating that flood where you have erosion, you have risk, you have cost, you have insurance, and then finance on top of that. But because you've created the flood, you've designed the flood with the way you've transitioned the landscape, you've also created the subsequent drought and fire. Because that water that used to feed into that landscape and give it water throughout the year is now all drained away. So then you have also erosion, risk, cost, insurance, and finance for the drought and the fire. And it's making the situation that's just really not viable for farmers, for land stewards, for citizens around the world. Now, in comparison, when we have a vegetated landscape and we have our big rainstorm, some is runoff, but a much smaller portion, a lot more of that water infiltrates into the landscape and then slowly seeps downhill through that landscape. And so you have some runoff at the beginning, but then a slow, steady flow throughout the year. Now you have vegetation that's continuing to transpire that water to actively cool the air, 590 calories per gram. So you have photosynthetic cooling happening throughout the year, keeping it from getting too extreme. So you can see really quickly with this one graph, how when we do this to our water cycle, when we create the watershed death spiral, 
We have flood, we have drought and fire, we have rising temperatures, and we have extremes. When we partner with the full water cycle, instead rich vegetated landscapes, we have lower runoff, less erosion, risk, cost, and we also have this steady vegetative cooling happening, keeping our temperatures stable throughout the year. And so this is what that graph looks like on the landscape. This is Manahata, better known as New York City, under indigenous and under colonial stewardship. Under indigenous stewardship, everything is sacred and interconnected and has role and purpose. Under colonial stewardship, everything has energy to be exploited. And what really drives me crazy is it's not being exploited for the best interests of those people, but usually for the accumulated wealth of someone else. And through this narrative of colonization, the oligarchs have convinced people to extract their resources, extract their own value for the betterment of somebody else. And so what do we do to undo this? Well, we transform watersheds into water catchments. We take these watersheds that we've inherited, that have been drained, that have been dried, that have been desiccated, that have drainage systems throughout them that have lost 75 to 95% of their wetlands, and we turn them into water catchments. We take those monoculture forests and turn them into rich, diverse forests. We build water bodies and retention spaces throughout the catchment so that the water that is received from the moisture over the oceans infiltrates into the landscape and then is cycled in the small water cycle again and again in the same place. In a lot of places around the world, up to 50% of your precipitation is gonna be from the small water cycle. So the more we drain water out of that small water cycle, the more our landscapes go dry, the more they heat up, the more our rivers go dry, the more water scarcity happens. When we feed water from the big water cycle into the small water cycle, we start to reverse all of those trends. And not only that, but we need to start increasing recharge and decreasing discharge. If you think of a bank account, if you're always taking out more than you're putting in, we all know how that goes. You, something comes up, you go over your limit, and now you get into this really vicious cycle of debt that's hard to climb out of. Now, if we're always putting more into our bank account than we're taking out, we also know how that goes. No matter what comes up, we always have a little extra to cover it. And so we're doing this to a horrific degree around the world where we're pulling water out of our aquifers as if it's a limitless supply with no repercussions and we're not putting anything back in. Not only are we not putting anything back in, we're actively draining what used to infiltrate back into the landscape to the oceans instead. So we're ruining the natural infiltration and recharge, and then we're discharging a ton of extra water. And that's why we see wells, creeks, springs, and rivers all going drier and drier year after year around the world. So we really need to focus on increasing recharge and decreasing discharge to balance out that account. So a great example of this, another mentor of mine, also a speaker at this conference, Rajendra Singh, known as the Waterman of India. His organization, Tarun Bharat Song, has done some really incredible things throughout India. You look at this village that was really out of options. They had no water. They were down to just nine hectares of agriculture because they had so little water. They drilled 27 borehole wells, all of which were dry, and they were out of options. Tarun Bharat Song convinced them to pursue a water retention landscape instead. And in the same area, for this less cost than the wells, this large water body was created. Now, this gave the community enough water for 650 hectares of agriculture. The young people who had fled and migrated to the cities for work were now able to come back to their ancestral grounds to a really viable future. And this community really shows what's possible. They produced four times the cost of the dam the first year in just their increase in agricultural productivity. So they paid the cost of the dam back to themselves four times over, and that will continue to produce year after year, generation after generation. Now female children who were carrying water all day can go to school instead. And so this creates these ripple effects all throughout the community. And they've done this over 35 years through a huge region in Rajasthan. They've really shown what is possible by community-driven decentralized water retention. 
And so they're holding this water in johads. They're allowing it to infiltrate into the ground. And that is recharging the wells and the aquifers that they depend on. So they're actually looking for vertical fracturing within the ground to infiltrate that water, to get it away from the sun into the ground where they can then access it later on. And so from this recharge, from tens of thousands of projects over 35 years, all carried out by the communities, they've created some really incredible changes on that landscape. They revived seven rivers to perennial flow, some of which were dry for decades before they started this work. They brought water back to 250,000 wells, impacting more than a million people. And not only that, they've reduced the temperature two degrees Celsius and have taken this region from 2% greenery to 48% greenery. And so these kind of movements can really create an immense amount of change. This is one of the most amazing stories I know. And we've got a film all about it called Reviving Rivers. Uh, so if you'd like to learn more, check out Water Stories to watch that film. And so what does this mean for us? Well, this means that our future is in our own hands, that we have a choice. We can continue to be the human destroyer that we know we're all very good at, or we can start to be human creators. We can start to partner with nature. We can start to partner with water and we can achieve some really incredible things. And so when we look at things like climate change, these huge issues that we have facing us, now you might not know how much of the heat dynamics of our planet are actually dictated by water. CO2, it's something like four to 20% of the heat dynamics of earth are determined by the carbon cycle at large. Now the water cycle is 70 to 95% of those heat dynamics, but water is very complicated. There's ways that it heats up the planet. There's ways that it cools off the planet. We only have this life that we know and love on this planet because of the water. Now they've largely in these climate models said our impact on water is neutral. But if you're paying attention earlier, you know that we've desertified one third of Earth's lands. So we've had a real directly negative impact on the water cycle. And so it's actually this impact on the water cycle is delivering the worst consequences of climate change. It's delivering the flood, the drought, the fire, the water scarcity, the food scarcity, and all of these are reversible. Now this isn't to say that we don't have a problem with carbon, but if we actually want a livable future, people aren't gonna die from it being two degrees warmer. They're gonna die from a lack of water. They're gonna die from a lack of food. They're gonna die from the flood, the drought, the fire. And all of these issues are very solvable once we partner with water. And so we really have our future at our own fingertips. Do we wanna be good future ancestors or do we wanna screw future generations out of a viable existence? This is the question that we all have and the question that I pose to all of you. So where do we go from here? I really hope we move into a future of more respect for water and nature, where we start to steward these resources, where we start to make abundance for life on land. But ultimately it will be determined by us, the people, what we do, how we manage our landscapes. It's really easy to blame someone else and say, the governments are responsible, the corporations are responsible, but we know very well by now they're not going to act. It's us, the people, the managers, the stewards of the landscapes that actually hold this future in our hands. And so how you treat your landscape plays a role in the larger water cycle, whether we're continuing down that watershed death spiral, or whether we're starting to climb back into a revived water cycle. So. I'll end with one of my favorite quotes. Uh, this is from Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Knowing is not enough, we must apply. Willing is not enough, we must do. And that to me is just so important because we can know all the problems of the world, but if we don't apply that knowledge, we're never gonna get anywhere. And we can all want a better world, but if we don't do it, it's never gonna happen. And so if I can leave you with anything, it's apply and do the things that you're learning throughout this conference. And for me, that's really important because when we talk about our environmental footprint, everyone's talking about lowering their environmental footprint. I want to have the largest environmental footprint possible because I know we can have a positive footprint. If we're only talking ever about reducing our negative footprint, we're never gonna be able to have a positive one. 
So for the last 10 years, I've really focused on creating these systems around the world. We're using fossil fuels. We're using the resources that we have available today to set the landscape up for a more prosperous future. So this is my elemental ecosystems, providing consulting and contracting for building water retention landscapes around the world. But I've also seen that I could work myself into an early grave with this and never have a meaningful impact. And so I shifted my focus to start trying to make it where there's hundreds or even thousands of people around the world earning their livelihood restoring water. And so this is waterstories.com. It's just something Raleigh has been a really huge part of and a really dedicated team of people that see what's possible when we work with water, see these incredible stories around the world and wants to bring these stories to the masses. So I really hope that you'll join us on the community. It's free to join. We have all sorts of great films, animations on the water cycle, educational material, and a growing community of people around the world that are really focused on doing things for water. And so we're just one year in now, and we've reached people in 183 countries already. So come join us. It's this movement spreading around the world where people are really learning that we can produce our own livelihoods. We can produce a viable future by helping others do things for water and nature. And so we have a place that centers all around training people how to do all of these things for themselves. Whether you want to start a business doing this kind of work in your region, whether you want to be the best land steward that you can be for your own landscape, or if you want to be an advocate for water, you want to spread this information so that more people know what's possible. This is our Water Stories core course, and it's all about helping you become a water restoration practitioner. Uh, so we just open twice a year. We do two course groups. This one's going to fill up for sure. So we'll open up at November 27th, and that open period will last until December 10th or until the tickets are sold. And then that will start January 9th, and we'll start with this next group. It's been really fun to watch our previous group move through understanding about the water cycle to then even having their own business operating in their country doing this kind of work. So we hope we'll join us and learn how to become a water restoration practitioner so that we can all start to play this vital role as keystone species for restoring the health and vitality of our planet. Awesome, thank you, Zach. That was fantastic. Yeah. It reiterates, what's so cool is, is some of the, so many of the things that you touch on, they have been touched on by so many of the speakers here. And that's incredible because we're, we're hearing about, you know, many went into how they you know, reversed migration and set, and Regendra told that story too. People like Penny Livingston gave all the practical examples of what people can do to start infiltrating water where they are on a small scale and these actionable items. So I think all together, if you, if you go through this whole summit, you're going to learn so many things you can do actionably, and you'll, you'll get your mind blown about the, the impact on water cycle restoration and its impact on climate. Cause that is far more impactful if we can restore and infiltrate water versus just, Oh, civilization has to suck down the carbon. And if we don't that we're screwed no that the message is if we can restore our watersheds our local microclimate then we can have the impact and that's beautiful so absolutely and you know even if we sucked the carbon down we'd still have all the same biggest issues that we're facing about this water availability and for me it's the thing that i just i find so much hope and power in this water work because when you work for water you see the results directly after the first rains, after the first rainy season, you see the impacts of your work. I think this modern environmental movement focusing on carbon, we won't even know if it's working for 20 to 50 years because of the buffering impacts of the ocean. And so the generations doing it will never see the impact. And it makes it a really hard feedback loop because we don't get any positive feedback. If we do all the right things, we don't even know if it helped or not. As opposed to that, when we work with water, we immediately see, wow, there's life here that wasn't here last year as a result of our work. And I think that's why it's become such a powerful movement around the world. Yeah, it's that 
or like it's that direct feedback with nature of the relationship with nature. You see the land turning green. People notice animals are coming back. They hear the sounds. They they feel it in the in the temperature being lowered, the amount of new moisture in the air, the rainfall returning, as you've heard of the story of Regendra. And so, Zach, I got uh, basically three questions for you to close this up. One is serious, but two are fun questions. I guess the, with the serious ones out of, the, out of the way first. So a lot of the stories we hear about that are done, work that's done in Africa or India, they pull off these massive watershed restoration projects that are really impressive. But in the West, we don't hear too many of these epic stories of, of like people building like large scale pond and lake systems. What do you think is, is the biggest barrier in you know the US, North America, Europe to getting this kind of work done? Yeah, for me, without a doubt, it's policy, policy and law. The way that our water law functions uh, makes it, uh, if you're not in outright opposition to the law by doing this work, you're in confrontation with it uh, in the sense of we're always prioritizing senior rights and downstream flows. So how early did your ancestors kill the natives and take their water? That's the first priority for who gets water. And then if you don't use it every year, you lose it. So you're incentivized to not save any and to use it at all. And we are consistently prioritizing downstream flow instead of recharge and infiltration. Uh, so these projects are happening, but they have to be a little hush hush because they're in opposition to some of the legal and regulatory systems that we currently have in place. Uh, and so I think this is the biggest hurdle that we have in a lot of ways. We're asking the people who are taking their hard earned time and money and energy and trying to make the world a better place. And we're telling them they also have to break the law in order to be able to do it. Um, so that's sheer insanity. And one of the biggest reasons we created Water Stories so that people can understand if we continue to prioritize downstream flow in senior water rights, we are going to have drier and drier landscapes until the Colorado River is a river that's been dry for decades. And until we start to prioritize infiltration and recharge instead of downstream flow and discharge, we're really just gonna keep making the situation worse and worse. Yeah, it's a great answer. And if anybody isn't familiar, the, the pond behind me is the pond of Sepp Holzer. And there's a great book, The Rebel Farmer, where he had to fight the government over so many years to build these ponds to recharge the Kremeter Hof and, and build his oasis. You know, just the saga of having to challenge the government, but the end, in the end, he was right. And so many people fight that battle and sometimes they don't win. But he had the courage to stand up and do that. And he was proven right over the course of time. And that's that's really and the I, quest of courage. Go ahead. And I think what's really powerful about Sepp is he's done it time and again in different places and continued to come up against the same walls and just smash through them one way or another through his incredible will, his volition to do, to apply, to make in reality. Uh, and so I think that's really important. You bring up a really good point that whether it's the developed world or the developing, the Western or the Eastern, the best examples that I know of all have these challenges from Sepp Holzer to Wangari Mathai to Rajendra Singh to Peter Marshall. They have at the very least paid lots of money, usually millions of dollars in fines. Um, sometimes been in and out of jail or with different criminal suits against them. And it's just insane that that are doing such a positive thing that can be so loved by so many are just condemned by their own governments. Yeah, maybe that's the next step. You know how we were, hemp was reversed just over the course of the last 10 years where now it's legal. Maybe we could do the same for pond building once again in North America. So two fun questions. Um, Warren Brush and I had this really interesting discussion about, he had folk remedies that a lot of indigenous people talked about how they would restore the spring or recharge a spring where they would offer it eggs. And he saw in so many of these cultures how eggs were always attached to the story of a spring. And when people would 
offered the spring eggs so many times they couldn't explain it, but the springs would return. And he actually saw that anecdotally in his own and in, in when he was recharging springs. Have you have you kind of heard any more of these kind of folk tales or folk remedies or these kind of unex these kind of phenomena connection with nature that are almost unexplainable and yet they're kind of proven right. Yeah, I've heard a number of them to uh, varying degrees of believability. Um, that is super interesting. I definitely want to, I haven't heard that one before. I definitely want to dig into that more. I know throughout Latin America, there's this technique that's becoming popular where they bury sugar in the ground in these certain holes at certain proximities. And they say, and there's the anecdotal evidence that it brings the water to the surface somehow. And it essentially creates springs where there weren't previously. Um, I've heard other stories of communities collectively meditating on the frequency of love, so to speak, and water rising to the point where it's actually coming to the surface somewhere within that community. Um, now, uh, some of these stories can be a little folklore and hard to believe. Um, and at the same time, I have seen the mythical gardens of Sepulcher for myself, and I know how freaky insane they are in terms of you're in this little postage patch garden that's tiny, that's producing enough feed for food for like five families. And every plant is just like totally overloaded with food. And they're doing it in the most simple ways possible with no inputs, with no fertilizers, and you look at something like that and it makes you think that there's maybe there is something really going on with the intentions with which we do the things that we do. So he's been whispering to his plants. That's what he's been doing all along. Come on, grow for me. <laughs> cool. I guess um, one, one last question. You know, I, I really love how in your talks, you always weave ecological history about the fertile crescent, the Tibetan plateau how these lands used to be green and covered with rivers because so many of us, you know, we're used to our, you know, the way it is in the present, the way it's always been. Baker's Field has always been this gross desert. And yet, you know, a hundred years ago, it was this beautiful fertile area. Um, Warren had some stories, some ancient stories about warnings from history where in the book of Hammurabi, there were like the oldest, one of the oldest tales of humanity, they talk about, uh, there was a warning against deforesting the from the tree spirits. And this is a book from, you know, between 6,000 to 8,000 years ago, a warning against deforestation. What are some of the ancient stories that you look at as inspiration for what we could do in the future and also as kind of warnings to the present day? For me, growing up in North America, it's been a lot of the indigenous stories that I've heard um, from, you know, various different tribes and traditions. Uh, and, you know, one of the really eye opening moments for me was um, driving through in this area in the Gallatin Valley in Montana uh, with Sepp Holzer. And he was just so shocked and uh, he was almost heartbroken. It's hard to explain how pissed off he really was. Uh, and we were trying to get at it. And he's like, you see all of this landscape that has just been desertified by humans. It's been wasted by humans. It's a wasteland now when it used to not be. So I was trying to dig deeper and thinking, you know, how, how do you know that? I, having, you know, lived there for a while, it seems like the natural state and everyone talks about it as high mountain step. And there's all these justifications for why it is the way it is. And he said, you know, with the precipitation and the climate and everything that you experience, if there weren't the mountain there, maybe this desert would make sense. But because there is the mountains there collecting, storing that water, feeding it slowly into this lowland, I know that this isn't a natural desert. Um, and so then I later found out that this whole valley used to be known as the Valley of Flowers. It used to be two thirds wetlands. It was a sacred valley by a lot of the tribes throughout the West that all claimed it as part of their traditional homelands where they would go and gather medicines that didn't grow in any other areas because of this vast wetland that was there. 
you had to leave your arms at the entry of the valley because there was to be no war, no fighting, no quarrels within this sacred valley. You go there now and it's an agrochemical wasteland. I mean, the wetlands are non-existent, essentially. It's all a big sprawling city that's turning into something like Denver. Uh, but you would never imagine what it was seeing how it is now. Even talking to a friend just a little bit ago, you know, he was talking about how that area was had to always be desert like that, because how could anything grow? But if you actually peel back the layers, the traditional stories of that place, you find that it was a totally different landscape than what we experience now. Um, and so I think it's really important that we don't lose these stories, that we don't lose these connections, that wherever we can, we keep them alive, we tell them to the next generations, because it's hard to understand what's possible if we don't know what was there previously. If all we know is this degraded, desertified landscape, it seems unnatural to have a rich, diverse forest there, when in many places that is what was actually in place previously. Um, so it's, I know there's a lot of stories, even going back to like the sweet water and salt water gods and warnings from, um, some of the really early civilizations to then talks of the fire serpent in Australian traditions and how it consumed the landscape, uh, it basically how fire desertified that landscape and took what was a really rich landscape that had a giant freshwater lake in the middle of it with freshwater mussels and turned it into the great central desert that it is today. Um, so I think there's a lot to be gained and there's this real breaking of the traditional ecological knowledge understood by the people that it's important for us to actively seek out, preserve and pass on as best as we can. Yeah, I, I love that. I mean, kind of like Victor Schauberger, there, there's only the scratching of the surface of what we know of science versus some of these stories that have been passed down for thousands, if not tens of thousands of years. And sometimes legends and folklore hold the, the wisdom that science later comes to understand. And absolutely, you know, so much you of that is of precious. Yeah, you think of how many indigenous cultures around the world already understood that the forests call rain. And the scientists, the white people thought, oh, no, they're just confused. The forests grow in regions where there's high rainfall. But now we actually understand that the forests actively do call rain. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's, it's really important that we don't lose these things and that we seek them out. Um, because it's just, it's, man, just imagine the change has happened in a hundred year old's lifetime. And then we are only witnessing the tail end of that. It's hard to even imagine how perverted our landscapes are, how distorted and disturbed they have become. And so we really need to learn to look at the landscape and see not just what it is today, but what it could have been in the past. Yeah. Oh man, that, that that always excites me more. It's the vision of of rewilding, looking back in the past to create a new a new future that is not even imaginable. And Zach, I think you're this huge part of that, and you're inspiring people with that vision. So I hope everyone who attended this uh, session had a really awesome time. I know I did. Zach is always amazing to bring on. He inspires everyone to get dirty and and start restoring water where they're at. And I encourage everyone to check out Water Stories, too. Uh, Zach may join us for the live session. I'll, I'll let everybody know if he is. But, Zach, appreciate your time. I appreciate your wisdom and always grateful.